exchange and refers to the figuratively what it refers to again is the experience that one has when one is given a gift and the on a continuous way and the embarrassment or the difficulty that one has in accepting something for free over a period of time. It's an embarrassment. It's a kind of humiliation. It's a, it's a, it's a, really, it's a loss of self-esteem. But one is given something constantly without having to work for it. <coughs> what we said was very basically that the Neshama has a problem of non Now when the Buddhist is created the Neshama, he created the soul, the Neshama, for the purpose of being made to give it a very unique type of experience. A very unique type of experience. And that experience was completely told. An experience of very great ecstasy. Now we have not gone into the nature of that experience. We will do that as well. A little later on today. At series 136. But what we did was, we said the following. Because of the fact that the Shama cannot accept this gift to God, without working for it, the Buddhism says, I will create a circumstance or a situation where you will have to earn it. And the situation which God did was create a, uh, a, a world, which is the world that we inhabit now, the physical world, where, where men must choose, men must choose this goodness that God has in mind. By choosing that, one then establishes Adam Haba, which is a place where this great ecstasy or joy takes place for all time. That was the basic outline of it. So what God set up was a scenario, a scenario called Mishwat, the Hanukkah Mishwat. We didn't know if you were coming at so we had to be okay. Which has self-awareness, which knows that it's 
something good, which can appreciate it. But what we spoke about last week is this was an incredible task. And that when God created the Neshama and gave us the ability to know itself, in essence, He created probably one of the most astounding things that we've ever done. Because He gave us almost a spark of Himself. How was that? What we said last time and is that the essence of divinity lies in the word independence. <coughs> something which is divine is something which is self-sufficient, independent, and can survive on its own, not needing anything else. That's the true definition of divinity, of being a God. The reason why God is God, and why we're not, lies fundamentally in the fact that we need Him, but He doesn't need us. Not only doesn't He need us, He doesn't need anything. He doesn't need anything outside of Himself, because He already possesses all things because he is all things that's the greatest form of possession the greatest form of possession is identification to be the thing he doesn't even need existence nobody has to make him because he is the existence itself he is identical to the very process uh, I can't go into this event uh, you went to uh, the thing, but actually for yourself, I, I think I'll, I'll give you those that share that we had. You can benefit by that. Listen to that. I think you really need them. She does need them. No, she does not need you. She does, I, I don't want to offend you, but he doesn't need you at all. <laughs> I don't want to, you know. He created the whole world to begin with. He created the world in order to bestow a goodness on it. He wants to bestow a goodness. It has Mahana, but he doesn't have to do that. That's not he, a doesn't even have, he doesn't even have that need? No, that's not a need. We, we think of it. I mean, he wanted to do it. All we know is that he wanted to do this. That's the desire. But that, does, that desire or that did not stem from a need, you see. It doesn't stem from a need at all. But what does it stem from? I mean, why create the whole thing if he doesn't need us at all? Need anything? Because he wants to give the world, he wants to give another being a great deal of pleasure or uh, or a uh, simcha. God essentially is good and is the nature of that which is good to do good. That's what it means to be good. When you say someone is good, it, it refers to the characteristics of wanting to do good for someone else. So because of the fact that God wants to give this goodness on someone else, He created another being to be naked, to do good for it. But in order to do that, He had to give the ability to appreciate this goodness to awareness. Now what we said was that awareness or the capacity to know oneself as a distinct from all reality is a certain quality of separateness or independence. And it has a certain, it is a reflection or a certain shadow of a divine being. And when it was talking last time, you remember the subject of that. And what we said was that in the way you know yourself, you do not share with anyone else. No, no, you don't share that with yourself either. You may share things about your past life or feelings that you have, but you do not share your sense of self, your very sense of self. Your sense of self is you. It's what makes you as you are. You don't share, you know, your sense of self that you possess is yours and yours alone. You share that with no one, including God. And because of that, everyone is seen as an object outside of their self and their not self is me and there's non-me. Everything else is non-me and I am me, you see. And the feeling of being me is a complete thing in and of itself. Not shared by anything else, you see. And it's complete unto itself. And because of that, it is the one thing that we possess that can be considered as separate, as independent, and as complete. And because of that, it has an aspect of divinity. So what God then did, which is an amazing thing, He created another sense of self. He created a being which is able to see Him as separate from the self and as outside of the self. And the question is, where does that power come from? How did God make that being? You see, if a sense of self is able to see God as separate, so how does He make it? It's not within God, you see. Since it's outside,
outside of God, so how does he have the ability to make that which is outside of him? How does he control or design that which is really outside of him? You see? So that's really what we said, and it is this concept, which of course, now God obviously did make it, but we can have no idea how that was done. But what we said was that because of the fact that a Yeshama has the self, sense of self-awareness, it mimics God, it has this aspect, it, it's just an imitation of Him, with respect to one feature, and that feature creates the big problems. Because now that the Yeshama has a sense of self, it also has a feeling of giving. Since God is absolutely independent and does not need anything, God is not capable of taking. God can only give. You can only give, you can't take. Because in order to take, you must be lacking in something. God lacks nothing, and God cannot take. God can only give. And if you are a type of being who is independent, who is complete, you never take, you can only give. Since the Neshama possesses one factor, one feature, which has a notion of confusion, it has these one aspect to its being that doesn't want to take, that wants to give, which stems from this the fact that it is an I, it is a self. But of course, since the Nishama is also an existing thing, it needs to exist from outside of it. Hence, the Nishama is composed of two basic different factors. It is an I, and it is an it. That's what we said. It is an I, meaning it is a subject. It is capable of saying I, me, it is a self. That factor is a God-given factor, and it creates a desire to give because it's a complete thing in and of itself. This sense of self doesn't need anything outside. It shares with no one, and it doesn't need anyone. But the fact that it's also an it, it is an object that needs existence. It wants to take. You see. It has these two aspects of personality, hence it has these two proclivities or inclinations. It wants to give and take at the same time. How do you do that? That's why the Neshama can't sit still and let him off. The Neshama can't sit there and just take from God because of this factor. So God recognizing that says, what I would let you do is I will let you take. You will take. But you will only take not what I give you, but that which you create for yourself. I will let you choose. I will let you choose you will work for it by working for it you will then give to yourself God made the Shema creator he made it a little God for itself he said you want Olam Haba you want the power of my my divine presence you will take it, because you will earn it, and you will give it to yourself. That resolves the problem of That's why the Dishama must turn into the Mahabha. The Dishama cannot sit there and just take it as a gift. God did not give the Dishama into the Mahabha without earning it. This, therefore, is the origin of Nam Lakshmi the solution for the resolution of the problem of man super lies in this world. It lies in a reality where man is constantly tested and, and forced to choose. It's forced to create its own mind of God. Now, what I'd like to do now is to go into the structure of that choice to some degree. To get a deep understanding of that choice. I think it's time to do that. Are there any questions at this point? Yes. I just had a thought, and I'm wondering what you think about it. I think before you said that Hashem is everything, and therefore it doesn't mean anything to us. It occurred to me that if everything is almost like perfection, so it's something that you don't understand what it is. Perfection. Not perfection, well, it's everything. It's, it's we had two hours of shulam on that. We did. Okay. On, on everything you've argued with, and I have a tape on that. I'd like to give you that for you to listen to, and then you'll understand.
understand everything we said up to that point. Oh. It is a long uh, shear that we had going into what we can understand about the nature of God and explore some of the information that you're talking about now. Yeah. No, but the reason I said that was because it occurred to me that that the way the basis upon which human beings are on this earth is almost as like the, the less than everything is not everything. We have other groups who are bad or we're lacking, but that we're not everything. We, we can't have all the qualities of everything. There may be a peace, the shaman is a part right. of the we have, we have parts of qualities, but we cannot have it. Even, even if we had everything, we would not have it the same way God has it. There are two aspects to that. We cannot possess all the qualities which are perfect, and even if we did possess them, we would not possess them in a perfect way. You see? So there are two things. The kind of qualities that you have, and the way that you possess them. In both of these aspects, we're different than God. But an exact understanding that lies in that the shear that I gave. Has anyone reviewed that shear since the time Take one, four A and four B. Yeah. Okay. How was that on the view? It becomes a different. It becomes a different. Yeah. Is it easier the second time around, or is it? Yeah. Okay. Well, questions or what happens the second time around? I haven't. I haven't thought enough. All right. I'd like to know some of the experience on that. You know, it's the old story, and this is the thing, it's just it's not it's a thing. All the information that I give, you know, in all the weeks and so on, is something that, you know, as you sit you listen to it, it kind of goes in here and you think about it and it kind of changes certain things in your head and it shifts some sort of mental furniture around. You see, but the truth of the matter is uh, that as I go from week to week and I develop this systematically, to really make it a part of you, to really kind of grasp what this is about, to get the feel of the inner part, you really have to go over this. You have to review it, you see. You really have to do that. It's got to be like a course, you see. And, you know, the Torah itself says that it's a lifelong effort, but in this case, it's been condensed and crystallized to a lot of degree. And, and I just like to say this, they would take very little effort to really bring this home. It doesn't take that much effort, you see. Sometimes you've got to find time in, in your busy life. So an hour, two hours a week, besides the sheer, to try and review the tape or review the thing, just to think about that. And that will pay enormous dividends on a geometric basis, not an arithmetic basis. You see, it's not like listening to sheer and then reviewing it and remembering it and so on. What happens is it begins to double and then begins to quadruple. You have net effect. Actually, and uh, it's something which is easily underestimated, but if it's shown on a continuous basis and, and with a little amount of work, we really do a great deal of an enormous amount of, of getting a feel or tapping what the book is all about, what is the pattern of God's movement, the pattern of His hand, so to speak. But it takes work. No, it's not easy, and it's, it's not. It's tremendously a that will battle against it. God knows you'll find, and you'll find anything in the week. Yeah. Just sit down and do it. It's enormously a and I know. Because it's, because it's, it's a very vital thing. It's a very, it's a very powerful thing. And there will be many, many, just in general, many different instances of, of, of great Sephora that will come up, attempt, and not in the allow you to do that. But to the degree that you aim to do it, you will reap a tremendous reward. No thought so. Why would you take it? No thought so. I would like to go into the structure of this.
God really expects from you in this particular pattern. And I, I just think it's good to review now, although it, it, it will be seen on many deeper levels. But essentially, this is a, this is a good design now. And what it is is that God wants to give the Neshama something called Olam Haba. Olam Haba means the future world. The essential criteria for feature which will exist in the future world is called Gili Yichus, the revelation of God's unity. Oh, I should really put that on it. Sorry about that. is a place, a circumstance, okay, and the essential feature of Olam Haba is called Gilihud. What is Gilihud? So there are two very simple words, but the truth of the matter is, everything in Ashkafa, from beginning to end, is nothing more than a deeper, deeper explanation of those two words, really. Gilihud literally means the revelation of God's unity. I wanted to create the greatest ecstatic experience possible for the Shama. How does he do that? Really? The way he does that is by revealing his power or his presence in the Shama. That's called Jiyihu. That revelation is the essence of the satisfaction that the Shama has. When God reveals his presence, which is a perfect presence and a perfect type of business. To the extent that the Neshama can see it or become aware of it, to that extent it is able to feel an enormous amount of sin That's a very strange thing. You see, it's a very hard thing to relate to. And we'll go into that. But it's the perception of God's unity, you see. The greater and greater perception of God's unity means of His of his perfection, which really brings the Neshama its tremendous Simcha and its Hana. But the Neshama doesn't want to take that Hana without learning it. So what God Hana means pleasure. No, that's Hana. 
no pleasure. So what God said is the following. Okay, I give you the choice. You work on this. You determine whether or not you want to know me or not. You decide if you want to relate to me or not. That's up to you. How is that? What he does is that he gives man the choice. He takes the neshama and puts it into a body. And he gives it two sets of desires. One set of desires is for the bodily desires. And the bodily desires create a certain type of illusion. What it does, it creates a certain feeling about oneself. It's a feeling of power. It's a feeling of independence. It's a feeling of control. The other drive is the desire for truth, or to know that which is real. It's the desire to understand what is the real force and origin of the world. What is my relationship to God? What is my relationship to existence itself, or to God existence? Depending on whether or not you will be driven towards that which the body dictates, or that will the soul to take, will in large measure have to do with the kind of relationship you develop with God. When God really says to the person the following, I want to see if you want to relate to me or not. I want to see to me to, if you want to choose to relate to me. If you want to choose to go after the illusion of the body and develop your own sense of self-importance, and by doing that, establish your own independence. Well, if you establish your own independence, what essentially are you saying about God? that he is not the absolute being, that God may be a super God, but I also have a little bit of power, that I'm a mini God, or a baby God. So God is a big God, and I'm like a little God, but I also have an aspect of free will and independence, you see. But once you do that, you rob God of his absolute independence. Because now that you are a little bit independent from him, there's something outside of him, something which is beyond his control, if there's something beyond his control, he is no longer absolute. So even if you say, even if you take one infinitesimal power or independence away from God, in essence, you've taken it all. And yet God needs it. <coughs> God, that's the illusion. You understand what I just said? It's an all or none proposition. God does not share power. God cannot share power. The sheer power is no longer to be God. The definition of God is total power. Either you have total power or you have no power. It's like a bad trick, though. What's that? It's like a bad trick. That's because... No, right. Hold on. The tent. Not a trick. Exactly. Just understand the test. The bunch of wants to see what you want to think about yourself, what you want to think for yourself. You want to see how you want to think about your own reality or the truth of your own existence. And if you want to think about the truth of your own existence and in some way establish for yourself some aspect of force and some aspect of power, God is no longer God. You will have destroyed his unity or his absolute quality. That's called Hector Yehuda. You will have, you will have hidden the face of God to yourself. The person wants to know what you want to think about yourself. If you want to think about yourself as some form of prayer, some form of power, some form of independence, some form of control, if you do that, you will have taken away the absolute quality of God's being. Because you're saying, in effect, that I now share control with reality with you, albeit very small, but I share it. Once you do that, the ability to share power is to be God and to take away the divinity of God himself. That's called testing the hood. To go in that direction, to strive, to establish that type of feeling, is to deny the divinity of God, even if you admit that he's a super being. That's called Hesti Yehudoi, or the consumers of his unity. If, however, 
you attempt to understand the true reality of God, and by thinking about it, you realize that the truth is all power lies in his hands. And all I can really do is will, but I can never will against his will. I have no power against his power, you see. That in essence, he created me, he allows me to exist. He sustains me moment to moment. And he has a certain purpose for me, and my simple, it was the enhancement of my reality lies in my linking up with him, getting close to him, connecting with him. That's really where the clear lies. That's where the true simple or joy lies. If you do that, if you choose that direction, you will have given God his divinity. You yourself will have revealed his unity to yourself. Hence, you are the focus. You are the pivot. You have the choice of taking the divinity away from God and to yourself, or giving it to God, depending on what you want to think about yourself. Do you see how that goes? He lies in you. This is the fundamental word. Now that doesn't mean you've taken anything away from God. But God allows you the illusion. More than allows you, He actually goes ahead and attempts to seduce you away from Him. He tries to do everything possible to entice you, to make you believe the illusion that you are a force and a power. God creates this in a specific ratio, a 50-50 ratio, you see. God creates two forces, each one attempting to seduce you in its own path. One says, God is God, the other says, you are God. That's the choice. What? Represented by the Gup and the Shama. This really is represented in Hebrew by the famous statement, and it's something you really have to remember. If we don't, can't communicate with God verbally, how do we really know what He really wants of us, or, or what we, or whether what we're doing is with His approval? You have to look at yourself, number one, and you have to look at the Torah. What, I mean, I've been in this and I, and I work for and I work for life. Which has very little to do with Torah. How do we know whether the decisions we're making uh, for our okay. careers, our work, are. Uh, well, yeah, Halakhically, you have to learn Torah, you have to attempt to gain more and more knowledge of this. You have to learn, what you must learn to ask these questions is that exactly what we do here. You must learn the purpose of your creation, why you were made, what you have to do. What kind of work you should do? I'm not going to they will tell you what kind of person you should, you should be. The kind of person you should be will tell you, together with your talents and abilities, what kind of work you should do. But the work that you do is not the, the critical part. It's how you regard yourself to that work. What you think of yourself in terms of the work. It's how you relate to other people. How you relate to your own job and how you allow it to tell, to dictate the terms of yourself. What it makes you think about yourself in terms of God. That's what's critical. Not the kind of job, the kind of job that you take. The kind of job that you take has to be consistent with your abilities, your talents, and that which you find satisfying. But the key thing which God is concerned with is the following. What? How would you guide your life? Your career is not what guides your life. It's your sense of self which guides your life. It's what you want to establish, what you want to experience, you see, as your own person, as yourself, the kind of feeling you want to have about yourself, how important you want to be to yourself. That's what will guide your life. Suppose I know all that. You I'm don't? Up, I'm, I'm how will you know that? Well, through experiences and through the health the good. There are many elusive experiences. Pardon me? There are many elusive experiences. But, but, I, don't, but I don't know if they're elusive or if I don't know. You wouldn't know by yourself. You have, that's what you must learn Torah. That's, that's you are, why you must learn what the Torah says and what it's about. Because in there it tells you the kind of battle you'll be facing. The pitfalls that you go through. That's what I'm discussing here. Part of it to some extent. And over the many weeks. This is the battle. This is your choice. Whether you know it or not. You may think your choice is about many, many other things. But you don't know 
the critical thing is that the choice that every person makes lies deep within his heart, very deep. And the fundamental choice is about is who am I with respect to existence? That's really what the choice is. The answer to that question is the answer of who am I with respect to God? You see what I'm saying? The subtle point, it lies in any move you make, in any way. It is so subtle that many times you're not even aware of it. But this is what God looks at, and He has the ultimate microscope. You see, is He able to see to the slightest nuance which shade you're into? You see, much better than you can. That means that we have very little control over our lives. Yes, well, you won't, in a certain way, you have very little control. Yes, it's an illusion. We will get into this. You will be astounded to find out how little control you have. That you don't even know, five seconds from now, you have no idea what you're about to say. It's going to pop into your head and then you're going to say, True. where did it come from? True, but we in my out, in our daily life, in our, we may think hour by hour, we don't think minute by minute. We still even got that a moment from now, but... But even more than that, five seconds from now, you do not know what you're about to say. Do you? Where's the thought coming from? What well, pops into your head so you think that you said it. It's yours. But the truth of matter is it's not yours. It's given to you. And as it gives you, suddenly you experience it, and you begin to try and act on it. We'll go into that much more. The key question here is this. So I'll say, yes. the key question is we'll go into that later on. But the key point is this, you see. The key problem is itself. Like, like giving us self. We have to battle the thing that self is. Yes. And acknowledge that that self is only that spark, and it's only given to us for the purpose of appreciating the self, and not give into what self does, which is give, oh, give you over all this other stuff that is involved that, that, that comes with the term of being the self, which is independence and, and power and, and autonomy. Very well said. In essence, what it lies in, a person can get caught up but the fact that itself relates to independence and it can allow it to go astray. Exactly. What the Virgin wants you to realize is even though you are a self and you have a certain aspect of independence, but it's not true independence. It's only independence as it relates to awareness, but it is not independence as it relates to existence. You have no control over reality. The only thing you have control over is awareness. You can be aware that's what you are, in essence. But you cannot really do. To do, you must come off to God's power. You see. The choice is out of control. I want to understand how. Choice is in your control. Choice. Yes. You see. But what is that choice? That choice is really lies in how you think of God. Therefore, <laughs> the equation is direct. If you reveal the equal of God, if you establish the correct relationship between yourself and God, by realizing who you are and who He is, and how you two relate with each other, if you develop that kind of relationship with the Bonachon, you see, where you realize that He is the giver, the origin, the source, you see, He is a power, and you are the recipient, you see, the one who needs Him, and the one who wants to connect with Him, in that way, you will have established in yourself a true perception of you and God. That perception of Gil Yichud then becomes literally your Olam Haba, which is a permanent state of that, where there is no choice. In Olam Haba, there is no such choice as this or that, you see. Olam Haba is a place when there is no more illusion. You cannot fool yourself and think, you see, because in Olam Haba, the presence of God is imminent. It's manifest. It's there. There's no concealment. Like Malachim, angels. Right? Does an angel have self-awareness? Yes. It does. Does an angel have free will? No. Why not? Why doesn't a Malach have free will? Because it doesn't have two choices. A Malach is in direct contact with God. But go choose something else. How are you going to choose something else? 
If God's presence is imminent and it's manifest, what other option is there? Well, how can you even sustain an illusion in the, pre- in the presence of absolute light? You see what I'm saying? It's not possible. The shamas do, because they're put in the body. Allah himself. Like, nobody has. There is no free will in Adam Haba. Exactly. In that time, it's all a state of give you All of it. What is it going to say is that? Well, what is it? I mean, you would say Well, in a sense, it's it the keys are here. Yes, because well, I mean, the we're living and we're breathing and we're still alive and we're human. But the, the consciousness state is different. Your mind has reached some kind of level of I don't know if we call it enlightenment, but you know, some kind of level of knowledge or right. understanding. Well, the seeds is, is that enlightenment. That's right. right. Which you establish here. This is the enlightenment by relating to God in the right way. That's the aspect of enlightenment. That is the creation of a world of enlightenment, of a permanent circumstance of enlightenment. You see, you create Gil Yichud. You create the revelation of His unity, or the perception of that intense unity, that enormous power and incredible beauty to it. If you reveal it to yourself, if you struggle to maintain it within yourself. But if you don't, then what you do is you hide it and you make it impossible for Adam Harper to appear. Because what you do is you conceal it in a very deep way so that in you it doesn't live. You see, there's nothing more than complete illusion. Do we have power over the forces of the world? Okay. Yes. I mean, how much power? It, well, it depends on a number of things. It's not even on well, I mean, like hunger, no. you know, death, you know. No, not the minimal. Sort of no, no, not the minimal power. The minimal, the minimal requirements for human survival, you don't, you see. But you do have powers over, I mean, you can't control many excessive drives. But, but I'm not even talking about drive in terms of excessive no, you love to smoke, you love to eat, you love to drive your car. I'm talking about that. I'm talking about um, where the, where like the, uh, the drive to, to be, I don't know, but, you know, like overpower something else and ego and uh, sort of a psychological thing. The drive to become a, a great uh, whatever. The President of the United States, but you step on 20 people on the way or 2 million people. Do we have control over that? I'm wondering, like, how much does this, in this scenario, how much does the mind really have control over it? You know, how much does the victim become surface? Well, how do you okay. get the money? The truth of the matter is, no, but you're bringing up a point. The truth of the matter is, is that the more you give in to the Hector, the more you allow yourself into the illusion, the more you lose control, and you become victimized by the circumstances. The problem is, how do you know when you're being victimized by the head? You don't. Not totally. You can only, only experience and learning tells you to greater and greater degrees what real control you have. You see. You can't know it automatically. It's too subtle. The consciousness is too subtle. Because you don't really know when the thought of entering your mind is one that you really have control over or it's there and you just follow it, you see. There are different types of experiences. You really cannot establish when you have free will and when you don't. You cannot establish that. But the more you understand about the nature of this, and as you go on, the more you understand about the way God works, and when God removes your free will, and when He allows it to sustain itself, the more you understand the very various proportions, the better idea you will have when you do and do not control your own life. You see. But the answer to that question is an enormously difficult one. It's, really, we, it's a lot of information and so on. I can only give you the, the, the basic idea about that. That in your own experience, in any specific experience that you have, 
you could never be certain how much of it you really have is free will and how much of it is just dominated by the forces of your personality. You see, you cannot. You cannot know the true ratio of that. But you can understand a great deal about that ratio with much greater learning and understanding. You see, you just need to see that there's a whole premise in you
but we're talking of a long time in the future. So you have I, to I can't describe that now. I can, it would take me months to tremendous. You have to know a huge amount of information to understand what the nature of that type of being is. Because you also have to understand the origin of all the psychological processes as well. You see. But there is a possibility of a human being being with absolute free will. In other words, there is nothing in him which is unconscious. You see, which is an incredible thing. Nothing regressive. There are no infantile aspects. There are no childish aspects to a person. In his admiration, when he was created, he was 20 years old, right? He never had a childhood. Adam was created right away as if he was 20 years old. That's how he started. He started as an adult. God formed him and created him with an adult body of someone who was 20 years old. He not only had the body of a 20 year old, he had a personality of a 20 year old. Without any childhood, meaning that other wishes had the mind of a total adult, 100% maturity. That's an incredible thing. There's no person. That is the being of 100% free will. I'm I don't get a to see what I'm saying. Can I say another way to know the rabbi? There's 100% maturity yet. There's 100% free will. You understand? The man never had a childhood. There's not an infantile motion in his head. There's not a regressive quality in the head. Nothing. Total maturity. 100% free will. You understand what I'm saying? As soon as he does one hate, right? One thing, right? As soon as we go there, suddenly that free will is here. He drops. He now only has 90% of the free will that he had before. He draws 10%. What does that mean? That means that when it comes to a specific choice now, 10% of the experience of that choice will attempt to push him in a direction beyond his control. You see? He's only got 90% of free will to work with. You see? Let's just get the mechanism. When he's over to here, here, that's the graph. In other words, as this gets higher, this gets lower. That's an inverse relationship. As one gets bigger, the other gets smaller. The more deeds other does, the more he sins, you understand? The more he sins, the more he loses his free will. Until, and it is theoretically possible, to have committed so many sins of such intensity as to absolutely lose your free will. Totally. Now you ask, what kind of a person is that loses his free will? Well, okay. And has there ever been such a person? And uh, we have here a... Uh, I'm studying okay. Yeah, studying my life. Right, Tasha, right? Right, right, But the truth of the matter is, how will the free will in, in terms of certain specific things? But the question is, has there any, ever been a person who has lost his free will for all time? Partly right. Okay, you're right. But I want, is there anyone, if you were a person who exists, who literally has no free will, what does it mean that a person lives without being free will? What does that mean? You know what that means? You know what it means to have no free will? No, what? Well, yeah, but you know what it means? It means, for example, suddenly you experience a drive. And the drive has such enormous pressure that you don't think about possibly not fulfilling that drive. You just go ahead and do it. It's, 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 in essence, it's not a, a two-year-old, or well, actually, even a two-year-old, a, a one-year-old, an infant, a six-month-old. A six-month-old has no free will. He just knows his body intention and attempts to fulfill it. You know, there's no thinking against it. That's absurd. You know, it experiences the pressure. Animals are like that. An animal has food. What, Pinocchio has free will? No, he didn't, but like before. I mean, I hate to get into it. I hate to get involved with the controversy over the business. But he didn't have to lie. He has free will. So the more he lies, the more dumb, you know, like the whole change. Yes. Well, it's a, that's a kind of a, a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a metaphor for the thing, that's true. But he has a few basically. 
Right, but he's only got one two with one. In fact, there was a situation over there where he gets on the island there and they kill the donkey, they become animals. That's what I mean. Yes, that what you meant? Yes. That's yes. 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 The truth is, there has been one nation which has sustained that state of no free will. It is the only nation that has ever become that way. No nation has ever achieved such a low rank. Amalek. That's the essence of Amalek. You heard of Amalek? You see, what happened was that when the Jews left Egypt, right, every nation was incredibly frightened to touch them. Who would start off with the Jews? That's what they just did with the time. The story of what happened to Egypt passed around the world like wildfire. Egypt was the most powerful nation on earth. The most powerful. And look what just happened in the time. What nation would dare go against the Jews? Nobody in his right mind, except Amalek. When the Jews went out, Amalek said we will attack. What was Amalek's reason? Very simple. We know that we'll lose. We know that we can't be. But it's better to, to reign in hell than serve in heaven. I may call them. I'd rather die and fight against their God than obey his will. That comes to such absolute arrogance. The willingness to give your life for your arrogance. As God says, so be it. I take away your free will. So when the Molokai became a person who had no free will whatsoever, you see, he only knows the pressures of his mind. And one of the pressures of his mind is to evil. A Molok has only the side of evil. He's controlled only by that force. And a Molokai can only do that kind of thing. He doesn't know there's nothing in him that actually has ability to do good. That's why God says that when you come into the land of Israel, you must destroy every Amalek, man, woman, and child. Now that doesn't make sense. I don't know if you know that. One of the positive commandments of Mrs. Essay to kill every Amalekite. That's right. Now, well, that doesn't make sense. God who is so merciful, why is he telling me to kill every man, woman, and child? Because in essence, what the Goddess was saying is that he's telling us what an Amalek is in his very essence. You see? That the reason why every Amalek really has to be killed because he's the, he is the personification of the power of the sudden in human form. Why? Because he's reduced himself to that. But once he's in that form, you see, he must be exterminated like a tumor. You see, you cannot negotiate with a tumor. You must exter- you surgically remove it. That's what Amalek is. Because he exists this Amalek because in fact he has no free will. And he would always seek to undermine truth, and that was his good. He, he must deal with them like he's a tumor. That's exactly what it is. But we see, that's because Amalek reached the bottom of the grass. Because he himself went out this far. But the goal of our free will is to reach no free will but on the other end. Yes. Very good. The goal is, right, very good, is really to remove free will too. But on the other end, the goal is to do so many might and total, to do so many good deeds, that the free will begins to be taken away, and we begin to become a reflection only of the force of good, of the Kedusha, of holiness. You see what I'm saying? Hence, we want to establish ourselves in an ultimate state of non-free will. Because what is Oedem Haba? Oedem Haba is really a state of no free will. It's a state of total vichus, total vichudai. So what we see, therefore, is that the purpose of man is not to be a being of free will, but it's to be a being of no free will, except to being a being, giving up his free will in a positive direction, so that we achieve perfection. Because once you achieve perfection, you don't need free will. Free will is only necessary to achieve that perfection on your own terms. That's where the gift is important. It is a means to an end. It is not an end in itself. You don't need free will when there are no choices to make. Exactly. If you've achieved a reward, you need to, you need, you don't need to make any choices well, anymore. Well, this man, he's so dedicated to God, if nothing else but man but God and John, then you don't have a choice. That's the only way as far as you're concerned. There's no choice to make. Yes, but it's very difficult to lose your free will with God. There's very few people who've ever done that. I mean, if you've uh, you reached a level where God doesn't need to give you free will anymore because you've reached such a high level of spirituality, it's a very unusual affair. The question is whether we reach that. That's a good question. Mm-hmm.
And that demonstrates how much you really fear me, and how much you really love me, you see. What is the level of your commitment to me, really? Will you do this and commit yourself to me, even though it's something as painful, you see, as giving up your own son, not your son, but giving up your entire future? Or, the future is no important. Not because it's something that I ask you to do. You know, you're happy to do what I say and to represent me. Not because you want to follow my will. It's not out of your loyalty to me or your love to me. But out of your own esteem. Out of the fact that you will be the father of a nation. You see. What's the true motive here? So God says, let's see what the motive here. I will give you a test and I will tell you to destroy your whole future in order to do my will. So, it's your future, your esteem, your importance, but it's my will. Which one was the one thing which is always the key motive in all your operations? You see what I'm saying? That's the subtle thing. Very subtle. <laughs> very, very subtle. I've always been tested on the most intrinsic sense of his own self-esteem and how much he wanted to see the Jews coming from him and not from somebody else. You see, because I could have thought maybe God now is going to pick somebody else. And you see, and I will have lost out the privilege of being the father of the Jews and the father of the nation who will redeem the world in Kedusha, you see. But God says, Avon, you yourself must destroy your dream. So God actually said to hey, Avon, you must destroy your dream to do my will. Because which is more important? Your dream or my will? You see the subtlety of that? You see, that's a very subtle thing. But Avon, that was about the only thing that Avon could handle, you see. I mean, Avon was such a big topic that God, the only few things that are, le- 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 that are left, is that finally the Bunishman had to test Avon in the most important thing, his very purpose, and see whether or not he would even give that up. You know, what God was saying is, what is more important, your own sense of self-esteem or your love of me? Choose between the two. You see what I'm saying? So the bigger the topic you are, not the more powerful you get are, but the more subtle, the more fine, you know? God would never test us that, uh, us that way, because most of us would instantly choose our own self-esteem. You see? You get it? So God's not going to do that. But in someone like Avon, who has worked himself out with such a madrega, God wants to test that, that aspect and that quality. But only on a very high level, you see. But it's not the power of the, of the force which is greater. Avon did have a more powerful detail than, than we have, but it's much more subtle, much more sophisticated. But if we set the sophistication of the use of our hands, does that ratio that you told us, let's say, in two of Still remains.
the power of good becomes more powerful. Because as everything is becoming more subtler, the power of tov, of Kedusha, is becoming more and more powerful. You see, so the Yetz Ahura has to become subtler. You have to distinguish between the, the relative power of the two forces, which must always remain 50-50, and the status of the entire arena, or the entire conflict itself, if it's, a, if it's a conflict which is more in terms of direct body experience, or more subtle body experience. Am I clear with them? It's quite very difficult. It yes. Seems, it seems contradictory. It seems contradictory. Okay, then let's see that. We'll get to that some other time. Because we haven't really delved into the Yates of Hara. Yes. Now. So let's see that. When we get to the other one, let's see that. The lane is a little bit. Yes. Yeah. I know there's twist. The variables here are too. too dis- so I have to wait. You have to wait. Let me see that if you want. But you have a general idea of what I'm talking about. But the important thing is that this inverse relationship exists. You see. So when you ask me, you see, it doesn't seem to me, it seems to be very difficult to do that. You're right. That's because we are a long way from other Mauritians. It's also because that's what occurred to me that, that you see the test of choosing God or choosing the mountain as the subtlety. You know, let's say I can give up food, I can give up drink, I can give up women, I can give up whatever it is, but I can't give up my self-esteem. Yes, you say like that, but it's subtlety of it. It's in the realm of where the... For who? For a person of our bond, for the topic. Well, I think people who even do, you know, fasting talking, I mean, you know, it's like that becomes like, let's say, an idea of an ultimate test. Yes. And I, and my thought is that to me, that, that's the basic test. The giving up the food and everything after that is nonsense. Yes, it is the basic test. It always is the basic test. Except that that test has many different forms. To a, person, the, the, to a regular person, self-esteem is wedded to his body, to the drive of his body. To a, a more sophisticated person, self-esteem is more attached to maybe intellectual aspects. It becomes, you know, self-esteem itself is the bottom line. Yeah. But the way it appears, self-esteem appears differently to different people. To, some, to most people, people who are on a lower level see their self-esteem in terms of their bodily satisfaction. To people who are more elevated, who are more worked out, their self-esteem now is more subtle and connected to more subtle drives and so on and so forth. It's always the self-esteem that we're addressing, but how it manifests itself is very different. Right. Well, I, my thought was that, in other words, my idea is that uh, maybe the concentration should be at self-esteem as a system. But you can't, because self-esteem is not an abstract, isolated entity. You can't attack self-esteem itself. Self-esteem is, you always has a vehicle. It rides in a vehicle. Well, yeah. That vehicle is a bodily drive, or it's an intellectual drive, or it's a psychological drive. It's always some kind of a drive. Yeah, no, That's the vehicle. And what I'm you understand what I'm saying? It's a thing that there's almost like an acknowledgement that needs to happen in the moment of the scene is that, that what's, what's the truth about us? What is it that drives us? Is it that we just want to do... In other words, people can run around doing lots of yoga, but they're doing it just to make themselves feel good and feel better and say, aha, I'm a wonderful person, I'm a bench. Then what good is the most in yoga, really? It's not, no, it still has a value, but obviously it doesn't have a very high value. Right. But it still has a value. Okay. A low one. Because it's always a value. But you're right. Because fundamentally, it's not the mind control, it's what's behind the mind control. You're right. That's absolutely correct. Because Gil Yichud and Hesti Yichud revolve around what's called the inner essence of a mitzvah. So what's called the Pneumian. The inner soul of a mitzvah. The inner soul of the intention. The inner soul of a mitzvah is the sincerity and the pure intention of the mitzvah. You see, the outer part of the mitzvah is the behavior, the activity, the right, you see. And that varies. The inner soul of the mitzvah, the tenenius or the intention, is what varies. The difference is that when Moshe Rabbeinu, for example, Moshe Rabbeinu put on filling in the morning, and I put on filling in the morning, what do you mean, Moshe Rabbeinu? If you watch me put on filling, and you watch Moshe Rabbeinu put on filling, and assuming we did exactly the same way, there would be no difference, would there? No. What's different? Well, the difference is in the penis, you see. 
What makes Moshe Rabbeinu Moshe Rabbeinu is the intention, you see, that his, his intention, you see, his love of God is so powerful, he's so imbued with this whole thing, is that the putting on Sula is almost like a shell, and the whole thing is what's inside. Whereas with another person, you see, the intention is much slower. It's just too it's automatically not. More automatically. But it's the inner feeling, the intention, which is a critical part. Exactly. I, I don't think I understand this, but I could just repeat what I think you're saying, and I can store it away. You're saying that, that free will can be climbed, but that any point on that line, the, the balance between the heart and the soul is equal. Yes. It looks like a competition. The more subtle the Yitzhahara, but it's equal. It's always equal to the Yitzhahara, but it's much more subtle. It's in a higher plane. The whole battle takes place on a higher plane. Between the two. Between the two. It's not more physical than it's more physical, you see. Now it's maybe, like, for example, you can, you can have a war with, you know, the wars you can have on the battlefield, and you can have a war with some about, you can have a war with computers, you see. You know, the whole battle was taken to a different arena. It's much higher, much more subtle. Is Abraham knowing that he's being tested with the Lord of God? Yes, of course. Do all the great sons yes. know that? Sure. So what? Uh, so every, every person should know that. Whenever he's in different circumstances, he might be tested. Every person knows that. What the test is is not always clear. That's why the person, before a person acts, he has to think about it, and he has to analyze it. Okay, we'll stop here. That's where you're going to help us. Because we hear the horror. Okay. You know, the